Well, hello everybody, Jan Rutherford here with Self-Reliant Leadership. Glad you're with me today for this workshop that we at LinkedIn are experimenting with. And uh, if you could, let me know where you're dialing in from. Put it in the chat and I'll uh, monitor that and let me know um, where in the country you sit today. Um, would, would be interested to know. The whole idea behind today's workshop is what should I do about my peers? As an executive coach, there's three things I hear about the most um, from people. One is balancing their time. The second one is working more on strategy. And the third one is more and more, how do I deal with people that might be difficult? Or I, I'm good with my team, but I'm having trouble managing my peers or building an alliance or a coalition to be more effective with my boss. So. That's the whole idea today is I'm going to talk to you about some of the things I talk to my clients about all the time. So again, if you could um, go ahead and, and let me know where you're calling in from, that would be fantastic. And as always, if you have any questions at all, just let me know in the chat and um, we'll address those just um, as quickly as we can. So let's get started on this and I'm going to make myself small <laughs> and um, make the screen big. So um, and the first thing I wanted to cover with you is, um, you know, why, why can't my peers see my intentions? My intentions are really good, um, but they can't see that. And, um, and that's what we're gonna really focus on. So the agenda is we're gonna cover the ground rules, why having a strong relationship with your peers matters, the three pillars of self-reliant leadership, what's known as the drama triangle, something you do not want to enter, um, how to have more effective conversations, how to set expectations better, what the ladder of inference is, the Jahari window, and um, what, what the concept of head, hands, and heart is. And as always, you know, we'll go back to Marshall Goldsmith and his, his well-known book. Um, it's important that you get to a certain point in your career to realize what got you here isn't going to get you there. And oftentimes that means a lot of the strengths that have gotten us here, you know, relentless pursuit and maybe attention to detail and different things like that. At this point, it's like some of those things might not serve us so well in, in a position where we have greater responsibility. So um, the ground rules, please ask questions. Um, build on the comments of others, provide some insight that you have based on your experiences. Of course, we'll be kind and inclusive. And lastly, but not least, is hold your assumptions lightly. You know, you've gotten to this point in your career because you know a lot. Um, you recognize patterns, but sometimes that pattern recognition can show up as bias and keep us closed-minded. So we want to be open. So, hey, here's why this matters. A quarter of all employees out there, this is pre-pandemic, felt they were ignored by their boss. And what that results in is 40% disengagement. Interesting in that 40% of the country right now is supposedly disengaged, actively looking for other work. Um, why would they do that if they were happy with where they're at or happy with their boss? Again, we have to remember that you know, being ignored isn't like, hey, I'm going to ignore you because I'm going to be mean. It might be, I am so busy doing my stuff, you're ignoring what really matters. And um, it might be unintentional, but it doesn't matter. It, if people feel socially isolated, that they don't belong, that they don't matter, they are going to disengage. The other thing is about a third of the time when we do give feedback, we reduce performance. We actually make things worse because we're not good at it. And a, a majority of people don't trust the boss to tell the truth. And that is whether it be, you know, honest feedback or where the organization's at, what decisions are coming up, but they definitely feel that we're being less than honest with them. And, you know, the, the reason why this whole thing matters is coaching. And, and again, coaching isn't just something that you do you know, from the top down, and it's the people that are on your team. Coaching, leadership, influence occurs across the spectrum. And we know that people are effective at coaching, produce better results. In fact, they reduce turnover. 
better customer SAP, higher employee commitment engagement, and ultimately way higher net profit. And that's what we're all after because net profit is an indication that you're not only growing, but you're able to scale. So, you know, this is this, I'm trying to set the stage why this is so important and to quote the late great Colin Powell, you know, this whole thing, this about influence and leadership is it's about people. It's not about organizations, it's not about plans, not about strategies. It's about people, you motivating other people to get work done. And we all have to be people centered. So one of the ways that I think about it and the way that I coach is we start with yourself. You know, you've got to lead yourself. And that means taking personal responsibility for your own development, taking ownership. That ownership is something that we want everybody to have. You know, the dream of, an, of a leader is everybody feels like they're owners in the organization. And, and that comes from grit. And by definition, grit is passion and determination combined. That we're passionate about something, we're determined. We have sustained persistence. We're going to see it through no matter how hard it is. Now, if we do that, if we take care of ourselves, then we can start to take care of others and lead others. And the big thing is accountability. Now, not about inspecting accountability, but creating a sense of duty amongst the team where they don't want to let each other down. Well, we do that by providing really good expectations. And that is time consuming. The last one is leading the organization. And that is really about creating alignment, knocking down the silos, one team. And we do that through focus, the questions we ask, the direction we provide, the things that we praise and recognize. And this is really difficult the higher up you go, because the higher up you go, the more you're dealing with tactical operational execution stuff and strategy, long-term investment, um, trying to position the organization for years down the road really, really um, challenging. And of course, this is all done through the culture, the social capital that occurs between people, including your peers. Now, it's, it's important to remember when it comes to your peers, you can influence them. You cannot control them. The only thing you can control is your time and your response. And by response, I mean your attitude, how you behave, how you interact with other people. That is what we can do to influence other people. We can't control them. And what we need to do is make sure we and those of us around us stay out of the circle of concern. And that is things that we neither influence or control because they're time wasters. They take us off track. Um, again, reminder, if you've got any questions, input, anything along the way, um, please, please throw those in the, in the chat. Um, so the, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to peers, and we all know about Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team that you've got to have trust. You can't have fear of conflict. You can't have a lack of commitment. You can't have avoidance of accountability and you've got to have attention to results. And on the right side is, you know, what, why these things happen. If we're, if we're not vulnerable, if we have artificial harmony, if there's ambiguity or low standards or pride and ego and status get in the way. And of course, you know, what we need to do is start to trust one another. And, and as a leader and with your peers, you know, if you want them to trust you, you have to give trust. And one of the best ways to give trust isn't just doing what you say you're going to do. It's trusting someone to make a decision. It's giving someone responsibility and saying, I trust you to make the right decision. It's hard because in order to do that, we have to give up power. We have to give up control. Now, the other part is we have to work through conflict. That, that, that absolutely means not avoiding conflict. When we are at the conclusion of a discussion, we have to basically ask, who does what by when in order to commit to decisions. And, and part of that, who does what by when will help us hold each other accountable and achieve the group goal. So again, 
just some some basic concepts to keep in mind that I, I I'm guessing many of you are familiar with. Now, when it comes to sources of conflict, it's important to know where the, that conflict might come. It might be based on personality. It could be based on roles, front office, back office, sales delivery. It could be, you know, geographic. Somebody's on the East Coast, somebody else is on the West Coast. Um, it might be based on the organization chart, VP versus senior VP versus associate VP versus executive VP, whatever it might be. Um, there might be other sources, but oftentimes it's important to say, hey, this is where that conflict might be coming from. And what, we, what we'll get into a little bit is we'll talk about the drama triangle. We'll talk about slowing down to speed up when it's appropriate to stay in your lane and when it's not and, and what it really takes to hold each other accountable. And when it comes to peers, you know, I like to think of them as team one. Now, t team two is the team that you have direct reports. And the reason I call your peers team one is team one is where you get resources and where you knock down obstacles for your team. If you don't have a good relationship with team one, you're going to be a lot less effective for team two. Also, if you don't spend a fair amount of time on team one, I bet there's a good chance you're micromanaging team two. So uh, think about those, those concepts as we go forward. Now, there's uh, you know, something, something that Cartman came up with um, called the drama triangle. And I, I bet you've seen this the hero, the victim, the villain. And usually the way it starts is the victim is the per first one to basically sound off. And um, oftentimes, you, you know, it'll be in the, in the poor me, the complaining, um, blaming, whatever that might be. And they're gonna point to a villain. Um, and this is somebody that might be angry or judgmental or demanding or bullying or uh, whatever. And, what the victim is going to do is look for a hero to step in and basically solve the problem. And oftentimes that hero can appear self-sacrificing, helpful, um, maybe meddling. Um, what we need to keep in mind is once you dive into this drama triangle, it's hard not to get out. You know, let's say you jump in as the hero. You're coming in to save the day. You're going to be the hero for the victim. And then all of a sudden, you're going to be the villain to the villain. And then the villain is going to be the victim. And then you're going to realize, boy, I'm, I'm getting beat up on. Now I'm the victim. And it just cycles through. And once you jump into that drama triangle, it's really tough to get out. So I'm going to play a video that really explains um, what these are and, and how to move out of it. And so here we go. Are you working from presence or the drama triangle? Broad leadership group. Find them on the web at www.conscious.is. Conscious leaders know the difference between presence is above the line and drama is below the line. Most leaders and most organizations spend most of their time in the drama triangle. Drama is characterized by blame, wanting to be right, toxic fear, and adrenaline. Like good dramas at the movies, all drama has characters that play certain roles. The drama triangle has a hero, a villain, and a victim. The job of the hero is to seek temporary relief. The keyword is temporary. The hero is the one who gives a hungry person a fish sandwich rather than teaching them how to fish. The hero doesn't want others or themselves to feel the immediate pain go away without facing and dealing with the core issue. When I'm exhausted from overworking, I hero myself by eating and drinking mindlessly or surfing the web or exercising. When another feels sad, I hero them by saying things like, it'll be okay or I'll do it for you. The hero seeks value by being needed by others. The second role on the drama triangle is the villain. The villain's job is to blame. I can blame myself, others, or blame the group. When I blame myself, I say things like, I shouldn't have eaten that donut, or I should work harder, 
or I messed up that presentation. When we blame others, we say, it's your fault we didn't get that project done, or you didn't give your best effort. When we blame a group, we say, they messed it up for all of us, or they just don't get it. The final role on the triangle is the role of victim. The victim is at the effect of. Life is happening to them. For the victim, a person, circumstance, or condition is doing something or not doing something that is causing the victim's life to be as it is. I can be at the effect of anything, including my boss, my kids, the weather, my job, the traffic, the economy, my body, and my mood. When I'm in victim, I'm feeling powerless. Every role in the drama triangle is a form of victim consciousness. And in the end, everyone is trying to prove that they are the biggest victim. When people and teams work in presence, the roles change. The victim moves from victim to being the creator. They take responsibility for their lives and stop complaining about what is happening to them. The villain becomes the challenger. Challenges bring healthy pressure to the creator to support them in facing and dealing with their lives in a way that creates a breakthrough. Unlike the villain, they don't blame or criticize. In presence, the hero becomes the coach. The coach doesn't try to fix anyone. They see everyone as fully empowered creators of their own lives and seek to support them in taking responsibility for creating the life they most want. Leaders and teams that learn to play in the creator, coach, or challenger roles of presence find they are more creative, engaged, aligned, and energized. They have more fun and get more things done. So, are you working? Are you working from? So I wanted to um, recap this this slide. I think it's really important that what we're trying to do is go from victim to creator, um, where you take responsibility. If you're a villain, we want you to go to challenger and, and stop blaming. And as a coach is to stop trying to fix things um, and, and not be the hero and empower other people. So again, you know, I'd be interested if you've got any stories or you've, you can relate to one of these characters, you know, to go ahead and put those in the, in the comments. Um, but these are, these are some, you know, typical situations that occur almost every day in, in every organization. And it's partly because, um, again, going back to the pillars, we, we don't take ownership and personal responsibility. We're not trying to create a sense of duty amongst each other. And we're not keeping the organization focused and aligned. And wherever you're at in the organization, you remember that leadership isn't just a role in authority. Leadership is an activity that we can all influence in different ways. And one of the best ways to speak truth to power is with an aligned coalition of peers. So let's let's um, move on to the, the next thing I wanted to speak with you about. And that was setting expectations. We, we talk a lot about accountability, but we're not very clear on setting the direction. You know, here's where we're going. And we do that by really, really spelling out the expectations. We have to figure out a pace that's sustainable. And that is about asking lots of questions. How are you doing? When we summit a mountain, it's easy to see where people are at. They're either going with the, the group, they're lagging behind, they're sweating profusely, whatever it is. But in, in the, the average work environment, it's really hard to tell if people are keeping up unless we ask them how they're doing um, in detailed questions in the form of inquiry. The next thing is setting a tone. And this is the thing I see most often left off, and that is having conversations to really know um, that we've got people's heart, that they're really committed, um, and that we're intentional about how we want people to feel as they're being led by us. Um, the question I often ask leaders is, are you easy to follow? Um, do you elevate and, and make people flourish? Do you empower them? Are they better off today that, you know, having met you and interacted with you? Um, is their life richer? Um, it doesn't matter if that's a subordinate or a peer. I mean, that's a big part of the job as leaders is to elevate people and, and um, you know, and, and again, we, it's, we're not in the industrial age anymore. We don't need to manage, inspect, and control people. 
we need to empower people. And um, a big part of that is, is how they feel about working with us. James Clausen at the University of Virginia Darden School of Business defined leadership as getting people to do things they otherwise wouldn't do and do it willingly. Now think about that as a leader. You want people to do things that they wouldn't do on their own. So you're asking them to change and adjust, but you want them to be committed. You want them to go, yes, I buy into that versus just, yeah, I'll do it. So a big challenge, a big challenge for leaders these days, and it's, and it's not gotten easier, that's for sure. So one of the things to keep in mind when you're leading, influencing, working with your peers is the ratio of five to one. And this is about catching people doing things right. We all know that um, for people to feel they've been treated fairly, they need to hear five positive things for everything that's negative. Um, they found that in friendships, at work, in marriage. The, the ratio has to be um, skewed that way for people to feel they've been treated fairly. Again, how people feel. Um, you know, when we give that feedback, uh, an acronym to remember is teaspoon, TSP. It has to be truthful, the feedback, it has to be specific, and it has to be personalized. And, and it has to be timely. It, you, you can't wait a week, a day, a month. It has to be timely. Truthful and timely, specific and personal. Now, here's six things that you can do that cost nothing but time. And we know from the Gallup organization, these improve engagement. And it's a gift and it's your time. In the last seven days, have I, have I received praise and recognition? In the last six months, has someone spoke, spoken to me about my progress? In the last year, have I had the opportunity to learn and grow? Do I know what's expected? Does someone work and encourage my development? And does someone care about me as a human? Those are pretty simple things. And if you look at the great resignation, the reason people are leaving is because they can't answer yes to these. Because what people want ultimately is they want to matter and they want to feel like they belong in an organization. And when we give people our time as a gift, they will feel that whether they're a peer or a subordinate. Now, when it comes to getting ready for discussions where you're gonna work with people and coach people, you have to, you know, or have a difficult conversation. The first question you have to ask is, is it worth my time and effort? You know, is this really piddly and it just doesn't matter or is this important? Um, you know, when, when I had the opportunity to interview Greg McEwen, who wrote Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, I remember he said one of the most important questions to ask is, for how long will this matter? You know, if it's, if it's weeks, months, and years, that's one thing. If it's minutes, you know, hours and days, it's another. For how long will this matter? Is it worth your time and effort? Now, I had the opportunity to interview um, Brett Mitchell. He is a music conductor at the Colorado Symphony. And I thought his insight when it came to figuring out what matters was really great. And he said to me at the, uh, the end of, of uh, my first season, he said, you know, in every, in every segment of a piece that you're going to rehearse, there are going to be 14 mistakes that happen. Let's say he said 11 of those mistakes, are going to fix themselves. The people know that it happened. They understand what they need to do to fix the issue. Your job, he said to me as the conductor, is to find the three that aren't going to fix themselves and do whatever it is that you can to fix them. And I've always taken that approach because and that again, we come back to trust, trusting that those other 11 things that have gone wrong will be fixed by the, the musicians. They know what's happened. So, I mean, such, such a key point. 14 things go wrong, 11 will fix themselves, three that might need intervention. Um, what matters? You know, Brett went on to say that a great orchestra doesn't just play with each other, a great orchestra plays for each other. Again, going back to my second pillar, you know, creating a sense of duty to each other. I mean, you know, woe is the bassoonist that doesn't come prepared and rehearsed to, re you know, to rehearsal. 
um, and know their part because everybody's going to look at them like, man, you didn't, you didn't do your part. Same thing in the business world. Are you coming in, doing your best and being prepared? And again, if you need to intervene, is it worth your time and effort? Now, the other part is when we are disappointed or we feel like somebody didn't do what they said they're going to do, let's ask ourselves three questions. Did the person know the expectation? Did they know where they stand with you? And do they know the consequences of meeting or not meeting? Uh, again, if there's no consequences for meeting, not meeting expectations, you have a culture by default, not one by design, because nobody's upholding standards if there are no consequences. And by consequences, I mean praise and recognition, those six things from the Gallup organization. On the other side, it could be just a simple um, figure to hand on the shoulder and saying, man, you let the team down. You let me down, you let yourself down. You know, that's a consequence. Nobody wants to disappoint other people, especially when we've made a commitment or a promise that we would do something. Now, the other thing is looking, are there obstacles um, that I'm not aware of that this is person's running into? Do they not have the resources they need to get the job done? And lastly, you know, what we're really looking at is, um, you know, is this a, you know, they can't do it and it's a, it's a training issue or, you know, they won't do it or don't do it. And you have to wonder about their drive and their motivation. So as we go get ready to go into a discussion with somebody and we feel it's going to be difficult, I think we've got to, we've really got to ask these questions of ourselves first. And then when we sit down with that person, it's really about setting expectations. So I've got a, a clip here that I wanted to I wanted to play for you. So let me let me do that. Self-reliant coaching, leading others, is all about setting expectations. That's where we gain true commitment so that you can ensure what your intent is actually what gets done. Now, we talk a lot about accountability and there's nothing wrong with that. My argument here is we should be spending a lot more time talking about expectations and not just talking, but listening and really making sure that that's what's understood. And I want you to think of an analogy of two buckets. One is shiny and it's called the future bucket. And one is sort of a rusty old pail, and it's called the past bucket. The future bucket is where we set expectations. We describe our intent, and we gain commitment. The old rusty past bucket is all about accountability. Did you do what you said you were going to do? If, if you're really good about expectation setting, you should need to spend very little time on the accountability because in reality, the accountability quickly, after we learn the lesson, turns into reframing, resetting, recalibrating the expectations. So think of it this way. When we ask somebody to do something, we provide direction. We're wanting them to engage their hands, to do something, to produce an outcome. But real leaders engage the head and the heart so that when people are doing something with their hands, they're completely committed. They truly understand. The part that's sketchy, based on what you said today, definitely sketchier what we're gonna do tomorrow than today. Um, there's not like a knife edge, but there's a part where you have to scramble up a little bit. And you know, if you get a little freaked out by heights, it's, there's a place where you're gonna have somebody, you know, kind of helping you. And I mean, there's a little bit of a scramble and that means you're using your hands, not just your feet. So there's a, it's a pretty short section, but you know, if you've never done it before, it, you know, it could be a little bit like, oh, there's a pucker factor there. So it's really important that you make sure the communication sent is exactly the same as the communication received. And that means slowing down to speed up. That means slowing down to have these conversations and not making assumptions about what's understood. So as you think about leading others, think about accountability, of course, but think about spending much more time setting expectations and making sure your intent is clearly understood.
All right, I'm back on the screen. So, so hopefully the, that video really, you know, spelled it out nicely for you as far as how important these expectation uh, setting exercise is. And, um, you know, one of the things I'll, I'll throw out there that comes from Marshall Goldsmith, one of the, the greats in, in the coaching in the coaching realm was, you know, he starts out with, you know, where are we going with folks? Do they understand the big picture? The next one was, do you, do you know where you're going? Do you know where, how you fit into the big picture? Do you understand your strengths? Do you understand your weaknesses? Then it's about how can I help? Not what can I do? Because I don't need more work. Um, how can I help you? Because you're taking ownership and personal responsibility. Then I'm going to ask, you know, what suggestions do you have for me? Advice, not feedback. People don't want to give feedback. It puts them in a, a precarious position. But if you say, what suggestions do you have so that I can best support you, then you're in, in a good spot. So the, this is an initial big picture, broad um, discussion. But the thing we need to keep in mind is when we're coaching people is we want to pay attention to observable behaviors, not personalities. As an example, we can't say in a meeting, hey, you were rude in that meeting. We can say, hey, you interrupted Becky in that meeting. Um, let, you know, let's not label it. Um, people don't want to be labeled. We can point out behaviors because we don't want to label people. Um, we want to avoid, you know, the, the always and never in, in, in you. We want to be careful with why, and, and it's better to ask how, because why makes people defensive. You know, why did you do that? It's different than, you know, help me understand, you know, your thought process there. How did you come up with that? Um, what's behind, what was behind the work that went into this? That's different than saying, you know, why'd you do this? Why didn't you do that? And again, uh, you know, it goes without saying that we want to avoid coaching people when they're stressed and sleep deprived. You know, we're, you know, you know, things are in the world are kind of crazy. And I think we need to pay attention to what's going on in the world and, and make sure that the timing is appropriate. Um, if it's near the holidays, you know, um, it's, it's an even more stressful time. So there's things that we might want to do differently. So, you know, and, and when it comes to having a tough talk with someone, you know, the important thing is to get agreement first and foremost, that a problem exists. If somebody doesn't see how their behavior is affecting other people, you're not going to be able to move past that. So you, you have to get agreement in how it affects other people. And then you can move to the second thing, which is talk about, you know, you know, what are the options here? What are different things that we can do that, that are, that's going to make the situation better? And then mutually agree on the action to be taken. Um, get the commitment and the who does what by when, the specific action steps by specific dates. And then what we're looking at is following up. Let's follow up to, you know, provide encouragement and praise and progress. And if not, we need to have a different kind of conversation. And um, again, remember the TSP. It has to be timely and truthful, it has to be specific, and it has to be personalized for that situation. Good job isn't the same as, hey, I really appreciate you speaking up in the meeting the other day. It had a profound impact on everybody in the room. It really made a difference in people buying into the 2022 strategy. So some things to, some things to think about. And, um, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is the people that are performing at the top of the heap feel that it's your duty to have a discussion and bring the standards up of the entire organization. Um, because what they'll do, first thing they'll do is they'll avoid the people that aren't performing. The next thing they'll do is they'll leave because A players want to be on A teams. And it's your duty to uphold the standards and values of the organization, period. So um, th there's a, a book out there you, you all probably have read. And if you remember, if you're like me, the big takeaway from that book was seek first to understand. And years um, ago, there's also a book out there on, on system thinking called The Fifth Discipline. And um, there is something that the author described as the ladder of inference. And it kind of goes like this. You know, we, we all observe 
things in our environment. We select certain things we're going to pay attention to. We make interpretations, assumptions, conclusions, and we form beliefs, and then we act on those. But here's the thing. The beliefs we form affect what we select. Think of it as the CNN or the Fox loop. We're, we're going we're gonna to pay attention to things that reinforce what we believe. The same thing happens with people and, and in our work environment. And we have to hold our views lightly and listen deeply to hear true opinions and feelings and aspirations. What I say is hearing the unheard, the feelings unexpressed, the pains uncommunicated and complaints not spoken. And one of the ways to remember this is V-A-B-E, babes. Are you listening for people's values? Are you listening to assumptions? Are you listening for their beliefs? Are you listening for their expectations? When we understand other people, then we can advocate. It's really hard to advocate or to push our agenda if we don't understand somebody else's agenda and how they got there. So again, the ladder of inference is an important tool. Um, you know, when you're following up with these, you know, conversations, you know, some questions that I really like are, you know, what insights, breakthroughs or accomplishments have you made? You know, is there progress we can celebrate? You know, what do you intend to do, but you didn't? Um, what obstacles and challenges are you facing right now? And what do you want to focus on in our meeting to, you know, to meet, keep things moving forward? And lastly, um, you know, what, what are we going to agree to next time? You know, and, and here's a list of my top five and feel free to grab a screenshot here. You know, um, what do you wish you had more time to do? This goes back to the circle of control. What part of your responsibilities are you avoiding right now? What things are you doing that you'd like to stop doing or delegate? What are you trying to make happen in the next 90 days? was an area that if you made an improvement would provide the greatest return on time, energy, and dollars. You know, these five questions, these 10 questions, if you will, are super powerful. And if you think about it, you know, again, if we're going to move from the industrial age management cycle that we've been in and, and really gain true commitment over mere compliance, it's about asking really great questions so that we engage people and, and really that they feel like Again, they matter and that they belong. And, you know, when it comes to that, uh, you know, this is the Jahari window and part of, you know, uncovering blind spots for all of us is, you know, to ask for feedback and solicitation. And as I mentioned before, it's a lot easier to tell people what you're trying to work on and ask for advice and suggestions than feedback. And it's a concept called feed forward. And it's about telling somebody, hey, you know, I'm trying to be more patient. You know, what suggestions or advice do you have? I can't comment once I hear it. You know, um, all I can do is say thank you. Because if I comment, somebody's going to go, I'm, I'm out. I'm not doing this. This is too hard. You've got to make it easy for people to give you advice and suggestions. And this is the way that we really uncover our blind areas. Um, so... And, and sometimes it might be, you know, what you're doing here is you're disclosing, exposing yourself, showing vulnerability, like, hey, I have self-awareness. I know I'm not patient. Um, and, and that enhances trust as well when we do things like that. So, again, think of this as all different things that you can use, not only for subordinates, but really, you know, to strengthen the relationship you have with peers, that team number one, as I called it. So again, if you think about it, in the big scheme of things, what we're doing is we're talking about direction, what we want people to think and know, what we want them to do, you know, at a pace that's doable and sustainable, and then how we want people to feel in their heart, you know, and, and again, what we want are people that are committed, you know, not just people that are compliant in doing what they're doing. And, um, it's a, it's a, it's a tall order, but I think you're up to it. So here, here's the homework I'm going to give you. Um, I want you to 
to get out the Google machine and, and, and do some homework on the drama triangle and, and really dive into that and figure out, you know, is that taking place in my environment? Am I a participant in that? And what are things that I can do to be more of a creator, more of a challenger, more of a coach? rather than a victim, villain, or hero. When it comes to the ladder of inference, um, are, can you use that tool to better understand where people are coming from? The whole idea of seek first to understand. And then lastly, the whole I, I, idea of feed forward. Can you integrate that to improve your own effectiveness in your organization? So that's, that's my... That's my homework for you. And the other thing I'll mention is out on my website, the selfrelientleadership.com, um, I've got a page for our podcast that we've been running for five years with nearly 300 guests. You name the issue, the problem, the challenge, I bet we've had a guest on who's talked about that. So if you're ever in a, in a spot, in a pickle, if you will, you can go to the website and look, look things up. You can feel free to send me something via LinkedIn and say, hey, here's a challenge. What, what podcast would you suggest? I've had a lot of teams use a podcast as a pre-meeting assignment and then come into the assignment and talking about that podcast as it relates to what they're dealing with at work. So, and it's a shortcut to reading a book or watching you know, a long film or anything. You're, you're gonna get the takeaways in about 30 to 40 minutes. So that's one, one resource for you. You know, there's also a TED Talk out there. I've got things out on Teachable. And, of course, um, I've got four courses out on LinkedIn. Um, Grit, Managing in Difficult Times, Managing Temporary Contract, um, Gig Workers, if you will. And, and then a very, very comprehensive course called Leading the Organization, which is one I'm, I'm really proud of and one I would encourage you to, to look at. Um, lots of good counsel on that one. So with that, um, that's all I have for you today. I really appreciate you joining me, um, you know, over the last 45 minutes and really hope that there were some really solid takeaways in there. And, and again, if you have any questions or anything I can follow up on with you, um, just send me a note through LinkedIn. And I wish you the best of luck and, um, you know, connecting better with your peers to be more effective with um, team one, team two, and the entire organization. In the meantime, happy holidays.